Hi, Patty Simone here, and we are delighted, honored, and thrilled Whoa. to be talking with Charlotte Beers, who is a former CEO of Ogilvy and Mather, an author of a book which I love the title, I'd Rather Be in Charge. There it is. Which is here, we'll just show the in cover my, right my now. My modest title. <laughs> And, you know, Charlotte, I heard her at the Women's Leadership Exchange Conference recently in New York City. She was the keynote speaker and just amazing. She covered a lot, and we're going to go through with some of the things, but one of the things that really intrigued me was your, your charge to us in the audience that you wanted us to leave that room being better master communicators. Oh, and good. since marketing and communication's my thing, I was yeah. like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because so many people can't get where they're going, and women in particular, yeah. because they don't have that. So if you could weigh in on that. Well, thank you for noticing. That's what I open with. I, I, it's my dream. Actually, it's a mission. And I don't think any of us get away without learning how to say what we mean. And you could take a lifetime doing it. But you have to start taking it seriously as an assignment. And you can become a student of how it is you speak effectively, that's just step one. Right. Passing information along is okay, but not exciting. Then you have another level of communication where you uh, influence people. Now this is powerful, and women are a little bit behind the men in the sense that they, they have all these ambivalent feelings about whether they should take the initiative in certain meetings and certain situations. So. The mechanics for doing that can be learned. I find that very hopeful. Right. So once you understand that you can be influential by how you behave and what you say, instead of remembering when you leave the room what you meant to say. Right, <laughs> which is often the, the case. We all do that, but if you do it that time, don't do it the next time. And then there's this other larger territory that I think is most exciting, which is to overtly learn to be persuasive. That's like the ultimate where a person listens to you and they say, I, I never thought of it that way. Then you're gonna have change. And I don't know if anyone's noticed this, but to lead means you must have followers. And these people are not gonna follow you unless you yourself have learned to be persuasive. So it's obvious, isn't it? And yet we don't study it like we might. No, and, and I guess part of it is also just recognizing that you have control over that yes. and that, that it does take study. Now, I'm used to doing things maybe in a certain way because I started acting when I was five years old in very local things, but you had to that rehearse. That was a great experience. Yes, the nuances of the line, how it was delivered, how you could get a reaction from the people. One way versus another. Yes, so for we, we me. Should, we, should, uh, we should mandate all of us to go to acting school. I, I could use it myself. <laughs> Yeah. That was good training. Yeah, very good training. So now you had obviously this amazing career uh, just spanning uh, advertising and communications issues and dealing with huge clients and then a little bit in the political arena as right. well. Um, and then wh where did you get the idea for this book? Well, I didn't really want to write this book. Um, I I don't think of myself as a writer. I think of myself as a speaker and now hopefully a teacher. But the book m forced its way into my life because I came back from doing the government job as Under Secretary of State, and I found that all the women I thought were in the ready zone had either been frozen or changed, or s in other words, they weren't making the obvious moves to, to sort of comparable partnership with men. So I began to study why, and I read a lot of great books that are written by um, academics. But an academic can dis define the problem, but is not going to solve it. So the solution doesn't rest in my earnest belief in institutions changing or men rewriting their script. Is that going to happen? No. Yeah. So what we can change is the way women approach leadership. And I got so obsessed with it, I couldn't have ri not written this book. <laughs> and now you're doing consulting on that as well, right? You're, you're helping I, I, other I try, people? I try to go everywhere I can make an impact in make, taking this message. You, it seems to me that you deliver a message in all these channels. I studied that. I did that for a living. But in fact, I think there's nothing quite like your own personal fervor. So when I can take that to a room uh, or a group or a session, I will. That's part of the teaching. 
And sometimes I feel um, that particularly the women are very receptive. And, and it's an interesting thing that happened to me at Duke. Uh, I went to speak to a large group of people there, men and women, students most of them, graduate usually. And there were four Asian guys standing there with the book. And I said, what are you going to do with this book? And they said, everything you discussed in the first part of the book about stereotyping who women are at business happens to us Asians. Wow. It was a wow. That's an unexpected. Yeah, because I thought you're so right. You know, Asians are assumed to be gentle and more thoughtful and more cerebral, therefore not leaders. So they had the same, therefore not leaders, conclusion. I right. thought it was fabulous. Well, then, new market for the book as well, <laughs> right? Unexpected let market, us, but. Let us go to Asia. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, um, I was also teaching a piece of the book at Harvard where there's an amphitheater and a large number of men and women. So many times I'm in the position, which I really like, of talking about the importance of communication and getting yourself ready to know when to draw a line in the sand, which, if you do it well, will make you quite grown up. You say, I did that. I took that test, right. and I won. And it's not about winning against other people. It's about letting your larger self have its say. Now, that's very satisfying. Very satisfying and very empowering because once you have that confidence, yeah. then that only engenders more where you are feeling, okay, I, I can do this. Right. And many times I think, especially for women, but even men, obviously all of us have these challenges where we're, we're in a situation and we feel threatened, we feel weak, and we feel like we don't have a voice. And I so know. if you walk in preparing yourself and you have some of these these winning situations, the more that happens, the better, right. like you said, the better master communicators <coughs> will be. Right. Now, you, you understand this, Patty, because you had to live it, but the, the dirty little secret of being this beautiful, articulate, persuasive person is if it's not in, infused with your own understanding of who you are and what you believe, you won't be hurt. It's just a bitter reality. It'll be, um, as it says in one of the great proverbs, it'll be as though you're an empty brass sounding. What, what is it that makes you credible? It isn't actually glibness or slickness. Uh, one of our most powerful creative directors, we named, I nicknamed him Mr. Lurch because he was awful. I mean, we just have to say to the clients, I'm sorry, you won't understand him, and he's not very good at this. But, but you'll find he's worth listening to. And they would follow him off the moon because he was so real. What he was was real. It's just like that, that story that you hear about one of the best salesmen ever was this short, very awkward looking man who was very, at first you would first hear him and I can't remember the name. Unimpressive probably. Very unimpressing person. And there's another guy, I don't want to mention his name, who has the same kind of thing where you first meet him, you're like, oh, you know, he's not a showman. He's not even passionate the way he speaks. Uh -huh. He's very calm and very laid back. But what he's saying, you could hear a pin drop in the room. Anytime this man speaks, you it's can hear a pin impressive. drop. It's very impressive. And what you can do is you study that knowing that may not be your way. And you say, what is it about that that works? So you take it apart. And then you realize that what, what works is a, a degree of authenticity. So in order to get to that authentic sense of your voice being your voice, you have to go do this homework, which I had to do myself. Uh, and then I learned that, I, that other women can take this journey. Is it just for women? I don't know. I don't care. I just want the women to get more ready. Right. Well, because we do have that that backpedaling, yeah. I'm not ready yet, I haven't had enough experience yet, I don't have the credentials yet. That's the whole thing with pricing. We're always critically underpricing ourselves, especially right. if we're in the entrepreneurial community, you know, yeah, waiting for that knows? moment. You, you could be, you know, waiting for that moment yeah. for years and then it passes you by. Well, I think the, the two things that are really kind of lethal for women, and I see this in even the big time executive women I teach, um, they would prefer to be discovered. This means that someone will come and be astounded and blown away by how remarkable they are. And they don't accept at first that it's their job to tell someone who they are and what they're about. This is not being um, 
egotistical. This is being clear. Right. And the second thing they like disproportionately is to be praised, to be applauded. And so it, it leaves you totally dependent on what other people think. When my position for our women is to say, get your own scorecard. You know, eventually when I grew up in business to a point where I was really clear what I could do and what I couldn't, no one could change my mind about that because I watched myself and seen it proven. Right. So I was in the position of telling them what I could do. And then they believed every word because I had come there the hard way through my own experience. I think that works. Yeah, no, that's, that's excellent, excellent observation and excellent yeah. advice for people to follow. That They have to be aware of it and they have to study themselves and break it down and then just practice the, the training from being an actor. Practice saying practice. things out loud so you hear your own voice saying things and you feel now comfortable. Now that is a wonderful point. That's from your actressing stages where if you don't try it, I mean, I did make a fool of myself with great regularity, so I don't want anybody to think that it comes to you, I mean, maybe Ch Winston Churchill, but the rest of us have to slog along. And I think your idea of being on the stage practicing in some form is, I use the word practice too, but not as vividly as saying, hear your voice, hear what it sounds like, fine tune it. And, and remember, you'll get another show. Yes. you get another one.